I have another superpreneur, NFL player, cannabis advocate, and of course, the host of one of my favorite podcasts, the Ebb and Flow podcast, Eben Britton. He like, gave me that like, well, how are you one of my favorite podcasts? I'll tell you, because I followed you from Tyson over to the Ebb and Flow, and you and I actually have what I call the same frequency. I love that. Different body types. <laughs> you have the one I wanted. Uh, <laughs> but I probably would have destroyed it. Uh, I, I seen when I was young to destroy the things that helped me most, my superpowers, so. As we uh, do. <laughs> but I learned. Anyway, I have a curious question. The name Eben, right? Perfect for Eben Flow. Your, your book coming out is gonna be the Eben Flow as well. Yep. Um, what does Eben mean or where did it come from? And why did your parents name you Eben? It's an old family name. My first American ancestor, a woman named Mary Bliss Parsons, came to America in about 1640. Uh, her and her husband, Cornette Joseph Parsons, settled a town in Massachusetts called Springfield, Massachusetts. Um, she had 11 kids. Not the Bart Simpson Springfield. No, 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 a different <laughs> one. Maybe the, the inspiration for the Simpsons, but um, she had 11 children. One of them was named Eben. He was killed in a battle with Native Americans at the age of 21. Uh, she spent her life battling the stigma of being a witch. And so everyone in the town believed that it was her karma for her son to be killed for dealing with the dark forces. So it's been a long family name. My mother's grandfather was named Eben Parsons. Um, so it's been handed down to me. And when you look at the um, etymology of it in Hebrew, Eben means stone of truth. Hmm. So I feel like that is infused in my being and who I am these days. I'm a big numbers guy, a big name guy. My name actually, David Meltzer. Meltzer means waiter in mm. German. Uh, and then David's beloved. So I'm a beloved servant. I love that. Which is, you know, my mission yep. actually. And uh, so, Coming in as a football player, you know, initially I imagine uh, as a young man at Arizona, you were completely focused in on one thing, yep. getting to the NFL. Yeah. And your mindset at that time, consistency, the discipline, but what other of the aspects of wanting to be in the NFL as a college student do a lot of people don't know or don't understand? Because, you know, obviously as we're running Lee Steinberg. I see it from my perspective, uh -huh. but I know there's so many layers of being a college football player and wanting to be in the NFL and different decisions that we make that may be good for us and some may be bad. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I had this dream to play in the NFL from about the time I was eight years old. Um, there was a lot of chaos in my childhood. Uh, parents got divorced, there was alcoholism, mental health issues. And I remember being at my grandparents' house in Connecticut, watching the Jets and the Giants in training camp. And it dropped this seed into my heart of one day I'm going to play in the NFL. And like you said, Dave, I mean, everything I did from the time, my mom would let, never let me play football. Finally, my freshman year of high school, I convinced her to let me play. And it was just this rocket ship to the moon, you know, everything I did, how I carried myself, how I ate, how I trained, how I lived and breathed was all in alignment to achieving this dream. Then I get to the University of Arizona. Um, and I was talking about this the other day, actually. You know, my freshman year, I had to redshirt, which is pretty typical. Sure. Um, I had come out of high school as the superstar athlete, had scholarship offers everywhere, chose the University of Arizona for a number of reasons, really wanted to be a part of rebuilding this program to get us back to a bowl game, which we finally did. They also had creative writing as a major, uh, one of the best programs in the country in creative writing. Uh, but that redshirt freshman year, I wasn't playing, yet I had to put all the work in I was always in practice, waking up at five o'clock in the morning to get our 6 a.m. lift in every single day. Then you throw in being a student athlete. You've got to get good grades to be uh, eligible to play. 
And at the end of that year, I was so exhausted and worn out. And, and I found myself a lot, I remember it very vividly, found myself walking around campus with my head down. Did you, did you have the BOMC problem? No, I, I actually had this even in my status as an average division three football player. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, but you're the big man on campus when you're in high school. Absolutely. And you're young, so you don't realize the nuances yes. of being a big man on campus yes. where everybody knows who, like people are just pedestal. I mean, they think Instagram, you know, you right, follow, right. like you, there's nothing better yeah. than being a great football player in high school. Absolutely. And I had this letdown and I got to play cause it was division three. Uh -huh. But I always said guys like you where everyone's like, Oh my gosh, he's probably good. Evan's going to be a pro someday. Yep. He picked his school. He's going to university. And then all your friends from high school are like, Hey, I don't see you on TV. Right. And then every guy there is in the same boat as you. And you get there your freshman year, you got to wait. Yeah, and a lot of uh, probably some of the best football players that go to like Alabama, Ohio State, Arizona, yep. these schools, they're ruined because of the, of that ebb and flow. No pun yes. intended. Yes. That you go from being the BOMC to they just can't be patient enough and walk your heads down. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. I th that happens. You see that all the time. Superstar athletes get to Division One football, and you never hear of them again. And to be honest, man, I came back after Christmas break. Even during Christmas break, I was like, is this really what I want to do? Do I really want to play football? Man, that was one of the hardest years of my life. I've got, I feel like I have nothing to show for it. And what it comes down to, Dave, as you know, just like, let's take one more step. Let's go get one more workout in. Let's take another breath. Let's keep just keep showing up, keep doing the work, keep putting it in. And, you know, slowly but surely, I mean, that's how you achieve greatness. You know, you just keep showing up. You keep giving it everything you have, even when you feel like there's nothing there, nothing's coming from it. And uh, that's really just what kind of got me through that hump. And the next year I was starting at right tackle and all of those those voices i could start to hear those whispers again like eb eb's going to be in the nfl one day eb is an nfl caliber football player you know and uh also i was surrounded by great people great coaches great strength and conditioning coaches great trainers great you know my mom the lifetime yogi had me in yoga classes and all of that stuff, which was such a great foundation for me as a football player because it gave me that yin and yang, you know, that flexibility and resilience to work through the pain, work through the, the lulls, the ebbs, the flows, and just continue to follow my mind's eye vision of what my life was supposed to be. One of the things that I find that we don't teach besides financial literacy, which drives yes. me crazy. Yes. <laughs> like I'm, I'm learning that, man. <laughs> yeah. Well, I had a, it's cost me over a hundred million to learn financial literacy. I was well educated, but nobody ever really taught me about how money works yes. to keep it. I mean, yes. Um, but the mindset of pain, mm. not just the physical pain that we endure from playing, mm. uh, but pain it, it itself mm. and understanding you know, it took me years and years to say pain is an indicator. It's not a stop sign. Absolutely. And how has your perspective or mindset of pain evolved? You know, obviously there's a lot of pain, physical pain, but also the emotional pain that you have suffered since you were 18, let's say. How has that evolved for you? You know, where was your mindset when you were in college about pain? And, you know, what solutions have you come up with both with cannabis, I know is something that we both believe in, yeah. uh, but also just emotionally, you know, how to deal with it. Uh, you know, as a football player, I was always in the warrior mindset, whatever it takes, tape it up, take the pills that they're giving you, whatever you got to do to get out, get out on the field to be at your best to produce. Yeah, I got to stop you because being a podcast, I, I'm loaded with stories. You know, love it. You know who John Randall is? Of course. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. John Randall's a good friend, Hall of Famer, by the way. Yes. And he, I think he played in Division Two and made the NFL. I think so. Right. Yeah. But when he was at Minnesota, Minnesota is known to have one of the oldest trainers 
Like uh-huh. the guy was there yeah. you know, back when like, you know, Paul, <laughs> Paul Bryant. I mean, yeah, yeah, ridiculous yeah, yeah. old yeah. guy, right? Yeah. So he goes in and, and everyone's afraid to go to the trainer when they're hurt, when, yeah. when they're, especially if they're rookies, right? Because they hear all these stories. So he finally, like his hand's broken. Uh-huh. And so he goes into the trainer and old school trainer, but when you were telling me, they give you the pill, they give, imagine being so old school yes. that he takes two aspirin, puts it in his palm and he's about to take them. And then he takes the tape, yeah. the old tape that we used to tape, yeah. and he tapes the aspirin to his hand, yes. and he goes, now go back out there, you P word. <laughs> and I go, we have come a long way. As much yes. as we still have to learn and love, yeah. like, could you imagine where you were there? Imagine that was the attitude when he was in, in the NFL. I know, it's insane. I mean, I was sort of the last generation of that old school, <laughs> and they were already kind of moving through that, but... But you were doing yoga and yeah, some other exactly. things. So you were like a little bit more. Things were you're like accepted. Danny Shays in Arizona. I mean, that yeah. guy was 18 years in the NBA at seven feet because yeah. he was stretching and meditating. Exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, and so coming out of my football career, I was overwhelmed by the reality of. I have no idea who I am, what I'm supposed to do with my life, how to relate to anyone around me. A lot of my life decisions, it was like a tidal wave coming crashing over me. My marriage was falling apart. I didn't know how to relate to my wife, didn't know how to speak to anyone, my friends, family, loved ones, because I didn't realize it, like you said about the big man on campus syndrome, I didn't realize it that Every single relationship I had was coming through this prism of me being a professional athlete. And so I had to go through this process of not only healing my, my physical body, but healing my spirit, healing my, my mind, reconfiguring my life because now I realized every morning when I wake up, I've spent the last 15 years of my life knowing exactly where to be and what to be doing from seven o'clock in the morning till seven o'clock at night. And now here I am, I have nothing in front of me at, during my day. I've got to start creating my life. And what do I want to do with myself? Um, and so that, you know, I love what you said. Pain is not a stop sign. Pain is a great indicator. Pain is a turn signal. A, it's an incredible teacher. Yeah. You know, um, and that was part of that process because in football, when you're in this cycle of every day you got to come in, your neck hurts, your back hurts, your knees hurt, every single part of your body is in pain and you have to take pills or do something to override it to go back out onto the field and you're doing this day in, day out for 10 plus years. Here you go, you come out of your football career and you're so out of touch with that, uh, those sensations and what's happening in your body that it was, it took a process and cannabis was a big tool in that healing process of coming back into touch with myself, learning about these, who I am as a human being, you know, and how my body can help show me the way to my destiny path. And as far as healing relationships, you know, obviously both of us have gone in different ways to, to heal relationships with self. Yes. You know, I put everything was revolved around money. You know, oh. My happiness revolved around what that, I, even, it didn't even matter, like that competitive nature. I looked at my bank account and if it was up, uh-huh. it was instant happiness. Yeah. And if it was down, I was like, oh, <laughs> like I'm bummed for the day, you know, head down. And I had to reestablish the relationship with myself. What relationships were you able to heal the most when you were able to heal self? I mean, that was the biggest one, obviously, is coming to terms with who I am uh, and, and finding this deep self-love. Because from there, no relationship can work if we don't have that. Exactly. You know? You're just chasing it. Absolutely. And so from there, I mean, then it started with my wife mending that relationship, starting to cultivate true intimacy, which is still a daily practice, yeah. you know? <laughs> um, I know, I'm married, 23 years. <laughs> you know Best how thing it in is. my life, but Absolutely. yes, it's a daily practice. Absolutely, you know? Yeah. And for me, as a, I think, as a, an alpha male coming of age in the 21st century, we don't really learn these tools of intimacy, how to share what's happening in our heart 
with our loved ones. Um, so that's been a powerful experience for me, but it never would have been possible if I hadn't come to terms with myself first. My parents, my relationship with them, it's, you know, my daughter uh, becoming, understanding what it means to connect with human beings um, from the emotional level. It never would have been possible if I hadn't come to terms with myself first. And now you, you know, healed self and became a brand. Yeah. You know, we both share that journey as well. You know, as always kind of Lee Steinberg's <clears throat> CEO or Warren Moon's guy, you know, whoever. <laughs> I, I didn't have an identity. Uh -huh. um, and there's a lot of healing that has gone on for me by having this podcast. You know, I think over 850 episodes of this thing. And it's awesome. This one alone, I'm sitting here going, God, I learned so much about myself through your experience. What have you learned? You have your book, which will probably tell a lot of the tell all of lessons in, in life and stories. But I'm sure with the podcast, both when you were with Mike Tyson and your ebb and flow podcast, you're learning daily lessons. It's like an MBA a day. It's a psychiatrist a day. Yeah. What are some of those lessons when people tune into ebb and flow that they can learn and heal through your podcast? You know, I've been thinking about one thing in particular that's really been the game changer for me. And I heard, I've watched a lot of clips of yours, Dave, and you talk about this, but it's not getting attached to anything, not allowing myself to become attached or identify with any sort of persona or job or description of who I am or what I am or what it's about or what it's for and just giving it all up to the universe, giving it all up to spirit, giving it all up to whatever the flow of my life has to bring to me. You know, I started the podcast with Mike Tyson, yeah. hot boxing, which was such an incredible ride. I learned so much from Mike and his healing journey. And a lot of that was about, as an athlete, as a warrior, coming to terms with who you had to be to be at your best in your sport, in competition. Um, the self-hatred, the resentment, the shame, the guilt that comes, that gets cultivated through that process of living through that prism of belief of who you are learning to let go of all of that stuff. You know, I saw you talking to Andy Frazella um, on a podcast, you were talking about the Ferrari. Yeah. And I thought that was so powerful what you said. You know, in this material dimension that we live in, and it's wonderful to have all these things and to experience and to be able to achieve great success and all of that stuff, it's fantastic. But at the same time, if you really want to be successful in your life, it can never be about the thing. It can never be about the Rolex. It can never be about the Ferrari. It can never be about the house. And I learned that lesson really firsthand in my NFL career. Here I was climbing this mountain to get to the peak of my sport. I achieved the dream when I was 21 years old. I had more money than I could have ever imagined, more access, more ability to take care of everyone around me than I could have ever possibly dreamed of. I had the house, I had the car, I had all this stuff, and the hole in my soul wasn't filled. I still, I was looking around me going, wait, I thought this was supposed to solve it all, you know? And it, it, it made me realize that there's much more to this experience of being human than any sort of monetary gain, material success you could ever want. And there's nothing wrong with that either. You know, we should all strive to be successful and to be the greatest version of ourselves that we can, but it doesn't come through the things. It comes through following your heart. It comes through expressing yourself, connecting with others, like your books, Connected to Goodness. I mean, this is what it's about, you know? It's about tapping into the deepest part of yourself and expressing that into the world any way that comes. You know, today it's a podcast. Tomorrow it might be just 
exchanging a few words with your local barista at the coffee shop that you go to, you know, and sharing your light with the world. Um, you know, and that's really the biggest thing that I've learned and I continue to practice. I mean, even coming here, it can be such an ego trip. Whoa, dude, I'm doing (laughs) Dave Meltzer's podcast. What can I share? I want to, you know, that little voice in the back of my head goes, Ed, you better be really smart. You better show everybody how much you know and everything you've been through, you know, but then I'm like, shut up, you know, go back to sleep. Because whatever it is, whatever it's meant to be, whatever I'm, I'm here to share with you and with your audience, it'll just come through if I'm open to it. You got that fully shirt on there. One of my favorite, another one of my mentoring clients. Uh, John, man. Yeah, John I love Fuller. that you know John. Dude. I coach him too. Yeah, oh he's one my of my God. clients. Um, it's so interesting because I think one of the most difficult blends, I'm 53 years old now, that I'm trying to articulate to people is you know the the realm of currencies of faith and money for Mm. example and that we live in a world of time and space of pragmatic man-made time and space it is limited this world Mm. but when you take on the capability to enjoy the consistent persistent pursuit of your potential to be the best football player you can be and in my journey people ask me what what tell me dave where's the closest you came to your potential and I'm trying to make it forgiveness because that would be outstanding. Mm. The certainty and, and peace that would come into my life if I could make it, it as close what God's given me for forgiveness. But it's football for me. Mm. And because when I was five, I put a football in my hand and I had probably the same dreams and the same love for what I did. I just wasn't quantumly built mm. uh, to be that great. But I, from the time I was five till 22, I put that consistent, persistent pursuit of my potential in. Yeah. And it was even more outstanding because I didn't get the accolades on the other side, like a Warren Moon, a Steve Young, mm-hmm. or a Troy Aikman, where it's like, well, he, or, or Tom Brady even. Yeah. You know, and yet I took those lessons. Yes. Which why money is so important with this blend to me because money allows me to learn more lessons. It, like the Ferrari, for example, and it allows me to learn bigger lessons. Mm. You know, I see yeah. even losing over a hundred million dollars; those wow. lessons are are <laughs> valuable. Most people yeah. couldn't afford to do that. Yeah, I was able to afford. I know it's probably a tw- my wife maybe hasn't really reconciled as much <laughs> as me, but I'm like, what a great investment yeah. I made in myself. Yeah. And she's like, no, you went bankrupt, you moron. I'm like, no, it was an investment in myself. I don't know if I'm overselling a little. But I love you, that. you yeah. seem like a person, you know, that has really grabbed a hold at a young age, finding light, love and lessons and everything mm. and being at peace. And I'll go back. If you've ever read the, the lessons of being human in Sanskrit, mm. there's 12 lessons. I'll text it to you. Please. Um, everyone look it up because it starts with you're given a body and you're here to learn lessons. Lessons keep on coming until you learn them. Pain will indicate that you haven't learned the lesson. Mm. You will forget, this is what I love, you will forget every lesson you've ever learned, but you have the power to access it. This is from Sanskrit, right? Before, so just to show you how aligned, for you understanding this blend and on the journey of more enlightenment of this blend, what has been a key lesson or a key thing that you have been able to think about to say, yes, I live here today with the Ferraris and the big houses and all this, but there's more, but I have to blend both of these uh, lives together. You know, never holding a grudge and forgiveness is such a huge one for me. You know, for instance, during my football career, I helped my mom start her yoga and spin studio in Jack's Beach. And honestly, I lost a lot of money. And, um, it was a really hard lesson all the way around, you know, because I wanted to help my mom uh, fulfill this dream of hers of having her own studio. And I wasn't paying attention. I wasn't taking accountability and responsibility for the money that I was putting forth into that project that I wasn't getting any return on. Um, so there was a whole financial education component to that. Um, there was also the component of doing business with loved ones and the, the really murky 
water of that experience. Um, there was the component of, you know, this is my mother looking back, like how could she have taken this money from me and not, uh, you know, not been able to pay me back and I was her son and she should have been, had my best interest in mind. But at the end of the day, she was really doing the best she could with what she had at the time. She was not doing anything maliciously. She was looking at it as an investment for me. Um, and so that's just, that was one of the biggest lessons of, that was just so, and you know, like yeah. same with me. I mean, my wife is probably still recovering from that one <laughs> yeah. and I've moved further ahead in the forgiveness process. But you know, cause you never know, like we're all in this thing together. You know, a big thing for me, a big realization I've had even just recently, cause I've had some, some, some difficult conversations to have with some people. Um, and really it comes down to expressing those difficult con conversations really come down to me expressing an inner need to other people around me of what I need in my life to move forward. And what I realized is because so much of my life I've spent thinking about those conversations like I'm going to war with people and I have to be victorious and I have to win this battle of words so that I can do the thing I feel I need to do. I thought to myself, Eb, what if you change the perspective on that? Rather than being nose to nose with somebody ready to fight battle, we're on the same team. I love these people. We're standing shoulder to shoulder. Let me anchor into the truth of love and let me express what I need from that perspective. And it's always in my head when I think about it and the fear is that these people are gonna say, Eb, how could you do that? When you ch come from the place of being anchored in love and you express what you need, people go, oh, Eb, I'm so happy for you. This is what you need. Any way I can support you, I'm happy to do it. You nailed it. In fact, I will tell everyone, if you have a need to be offended, if you have a need to be resentful, if you have a need to be guilty, do business with your mom. Uh, <laughs> yes. The need will be felt and, yeah. and filled immediately. Um, and you know, as you express, I will end this with the ebb and flow genius that we have here. The best piece of parenting advice, and please use this with your mom if there's any healing that still needs to be done. I call my mom every day and tell her four things. I'm happy, I'm healthy, I love you and appreciate you. I get choked up saying it. Dude, I love Because that. it has healed my relationship. Because as a parent, and with our girls sitting right over here watching us, I think to myself, what do I really, you know, she's in college. She's, you know, doctor, lawyer, failure. No, I just want to make sure she's healthy, happy, loves me, and appreciating me, meaning I add value to her life. I love and that. if you can reassure your mom of that, I promise you the healing will come quickly. Um, some great pieces of advice here. You'll get it also on the Ebb and Flow podcast. Of course, the book coming out shortly. You'll love it. Check out himself, Eben Britton. This is Dave Meltzer with another amazing episode with an amazing human being who we will be good friends. You'll see a lot more of us together. 